Hi everyone, this is the second video in my five-part series on solving the quantum harmonic oscillator. So in the previous video, we derived this simplified dimensionless form of the Schrodinger equation in the case of a, a harmonic potential. Um, we did that by rescaling variables, so our position variable x was rescaled to be this new variable y, and our energy variable e was rescaled to become epsilon, where y and epsilon are dimensionless. Now that will all make a little bit more sense if you've already seen uh, the previous video. But what we're going to do now is start actually uh, solving this to find the wave function phi as a function of y. So just to help visualize what's going on, um, I've just sketched out our quadratic or harmonic potential v as a function of y. Um, we're going to begin by getting an approximate solution to the Schrodinger equation, and then we're going to use what we learned from doing that to work towards an exact solution. So what we're going to do is imagine going to very large positive or very large negative values of y, so to the sort of the far left or the far right um, of that diagram. Um, the reason for doing that is, well, at either extreme of the diagram, we can say that y squared uh, it becomes infinite, basically. It's much bigger than epsilon at some point, right? Um, when that happens, you can ignore that epsilon term in your differential equation, right? And then you get that d2 phi by dy squared is approximately equal to y squared times phi. So this is a, an approximate but slightly simpler looking differential equation. Let's think about how to solve that. Now notice that if this y squared term wasn't there, we would just have the second derivative of phi as proportional to phi itself. That equation would have exponential solutions, right? And so as a first guess, um, we might think that phi is some sort of exponential but not quite as simple as it would be without that y squared term. Right, so I'm just going to write down, let's guess that phi is some constant a times e to some constant k times y. We know that this can't work, right, because this would just give uh, the second derivative of phi being proportional to phi. Um, as a guess, why don't we try squaring this y instead, just as a little modification, because we've got the y squared in the differential equation, and see what would happen if we were to do that. Well, the first derivative of phi with respect to y is fairly straightforward. You can just use the chain rule and say that when you differentiate it, you pull down a factor of 2ky, which is the derivative of uh, ky squared. The derivative is 2ky times the original function, right? a e to the ky squared. Um, let's see whether it satisfies the differential equation we wanted to, right? So the second derivative, d2 phi by dy squared, um, here we're going to have to use the product rule, right? So we first, let's leave the 2ky undifferentiated, differentiate the exponential again. We pull down another factor of 2ky and get 4k squared y squared times the original function, a e to the ky squared. Now, then what we have to do is differentiate the 2ky and leave the exponential part um, unchanged. Differentiating 2ky just gives you 2k. Uh, constant, right? So you get a plus 2k times e to the, um, well, times a e to the ky squared. Now, at very large values of y, this y squared term here is going to dominate over that second term. The second term is proportional to e to the ky squared, which is already pretty big, roughly speaking. Um, but this first term is going to be always even bigger because of that y squared factor. As y goes to infinity, the first term is going to dominate. So since we only need our differential equation to be approximately satisfied, let's just ignore that second term and say that that second derivative is roughly 4k squared y squared um, times phi, where it's just substituted phi in place of ae to the ky squared. So what this means is our trial function is actually an approximate solution to the differential equation, at least when y is very large, under the specific case where 4k squared is just equal to 1, right? Because we want the second derivative to just be equal to y squared times the original function. Um, that will be true if 4k squared is 1, because then that bit will just disappear and you'll get y squared times 5, right? So if we say that 4k squared equals 1, um, there are two possible solutions to that, right? Either k is a half or it's minus a half. So we can say k is plus or minus a half. Um, and so what that implies is our approximate solution, phi, um, is, well, let's, let's keep that approximate. Phi is approximately a e to the, I'm going to put here minus a half y squared, right? I've just substituted the negative value of k. Now, mathematically, you would also have some, you would add on some other term, which is like b e to the 
positive halfway squared. But physically, that's not an acceptable solution because that becomes infinitely large um, at large values of y, which doesn't make any physical sense, right? The, remember, the square of the wave function or the modulus squared of the wave function represents the probability of finding a particle in some um, particular region, and you wouldn't expect an infinite probability of finding your particle infinitely far away from the minimum of the potential. So we're going to ignore the k equals plus a half solution um, on physical grounds. Now, if we think a little bit more about this idea of ignoring certain terms and only keeping the dominant terms at large values of y, we can actually come up with a slightly more general solution than this purely exponential solution that we found up there. Um, so consider the following. If you, if you take your exponential and multiply it by a polynomial function, so let's say some polynomial p of y, um, and multiplied by that decaying exponential e to the minus a half y squared. And just think about what, what would happen if you were to differentiate that. Well, d phi by dy. Uh, let's say when you're using your product rule, you start by not doing anything to p of y and differentiate the exponential bit. So that would give you p of y times minus y times e to the minus a half um, y squared. Now, your other term that you would get from the product rule would be let's say p dash of y, the derivative of p as a function of y, times e to the minus um, a half y squared. Um, the derivative of p is going to be a polynomial whose degree is one lower than the degree of the original polynomial, right? That's how differentiation of polynomials works. Whereas this first term over here, that's the, the prefactor of the exponential is a polynomial of degree one greater than the original polynomial because you've just kept that polynomial and multiplied it by y. So if you were to uh, you know, do an approximation, you could say that second term is negligible. Now, if you differentiate this a second time, but again, only keep the dominant terms, um, then the term that you will end up keeping you'll, will be the one where you pull down an extra factor of minus y from the exponential and you'll get p of y times y squared times e to the minus a half y squared, which is exactly y squared multiplied by the original function, right? So because of the fact that for now we're only approximately solving it and only keeping the dominant terms, the most general solution to the approximate equation, right, is p of y, some polynomial function of y, times e to the minus half y squared. So based on that limiting form of the differential equation, we've come to the conclusion that um, our general solution phi may have this type of functional form, right? e to the minus a half y squared times polynomial. We haven't shown that that's valid for the full differential equation, but what we can do is take it and substitute it in to the original differential equation and see what it implies about the function p and whether we can find a function p that can actually satisfy the equation. So if we're substituting it into our differential equation, um, then we need to differentiate it twice, because it's a second order differential equation. So let's do some differentiation. I'm going to, uh, just to save a bit of writing, I'm going to switch to the dash notation. So phi dash meaning uh, d phi by dy. So if we apply the product rule, um, the first term is going to be from differentiating the exponential, we get minus y times p times e to the minus half y squared. I'm not writing p of y again, just to uh, make our working a little bit less cluttered. Right, second term is going to come from not changing the exponential, but differentiating p. That's just going to give you p dash times e to the minus a half y squared. Um, then just to clean this up a little bit, I'm going to factor out the exponential and we get p dash minus yp times e to the minus a half y squared. So let's now differentiate a second time apply the product rule again and see if we can avoid making any little mistakes, which can be hard to do. But if we first differentiate the bit in the brackets, we get p double dash, then by leaving the y, we get y p dash, and then by differentiating the y and leaving the p, we just get minus p there. That is all multiplied by e to the minus half y squared. Now we are going to leave the bracketed term bracketed terms undifferentiated and differentiate the exponential, that will give us a minus y, which is the derivative of the exponent, multiplied by the bracketed term p dash minus yp, multiplied by the exponential itself e to the minus half y squared. Now let's collect those terms together and factor out an e to the minus half y squared from the whole thing. So we've only got one second derivative, so p double dash. Um, we've got 
for our p dash terms, we've got minus y p dash there and another minus y p dash from the second um, set of brackets. So we got minus 2y p dash as well. Then for the p terms, you've got minus p from the first one and you've got a plus y squared p from expanding the second set of brackets, right? So I'm going to write both of those in. I'm going to say minus p and then plus y squared p. And we are now factoring out an e to the minus half y squared from that whole thing. But let's take that phi double dash and our original form for phi and substitute those into our original modified Schrodinger equation. Uh, notice that phi is proportional to e to the minus a half y squared. Phi double dash is also proportional to e to the minus a half y squared. That is not zero. It's a non-zero term, so we can just divide through by that. So I'm not even going to bother writing in the exponential term when I substitute. Um, when we do that, we basically get all of that stuff from the brackets uh, from our second derivative of phi. Right? So substituting, we get p double dash minus 2y p dash minus p plus y squared p. Then from the phi term in the differential equation, um, you get, well, plus epsilon times p, because as I said, we're not even going to bother writing the exponentials, we're dividing those, so we just get epsilon p and minus y squared p, and all of that is supposed to be equal to zero if we want this thing to satisfy the full differential equation. So notice that some of the terms cancel this y squared p and minus y squared p. Uh, let me just write out a, a summary of the equation that we've ended up with, dtp by dy squared minus 2y dp by dy, and then if we factor the p terms together, we get plus epsilon minus 1 times p is equal to 0. And so that means this functional form of phi, right, polynomial um, of y times e to the minus half y squared, can satisfy the modified Schrodinger equation up at the top left, provided that we can find a function p which satisfies that new differential equation that we've got there. And that is going to be the subject of the next video. So I'll see you again soon.